Hey everyone, um, welcome to the second Friday Hacks of this semester. And we're really happy to have Darianto today. Uh, we all know him as the former uh, CTO of Traveloka and also the co-founder of Traveloka. And today he'll be uh, hosting two sessions. The first session will be on high impact software engineering in the real world. And after that, we'll take a short break and we'll return to uh, his next session, which will be on tech entrepreneurship. So yeah. Uh, let's welcome Darianto. Thank you. Okay, Yehong. Yeah, thank you, Yehong, and thank you for the organizers for making this happen. Yeah, cool. Um, um, is the voice clear? Do you think? Oh, the audio is okay, right? Yeah. Okay then. Yeah, cool. I mean, it's really nice to see all of you. To be honest. I have not been in college campus campuses for a while, so it's always very nice to be surrounded by like young energy, like you guys. Even though I guess it's predominantly male, I guess who, who's who's like uh, the women engineers in here? Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, but glad that you are here. Mm, yeah, and I I I wasn't trying to attempt to monopolize your nights. Even though I I mean after talking to Irene, I decided to just take both sessions because I think it's quite interrelated, and I feel one of them is longer, one of them is shorter. So I think we can start with the more brain wrecking longer ones about software engineering, and the second one about entrepreneurship. Hopefully, this could be useful. I should take my mask off too. So I mean. I'll I'll die if I talk for two hours with a mask. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So um, cool. Can I ask a little bit? I'm I'm curious about the audience actually. So how many of you are current students in NUS? Okay. Um, got it. Okay. So probably like most of you, some of you are graduates already but keep coming back is it because you don't have life outside just kidding <laughs> just kidding <laughs> yeah but uh, i'm sure you guys are enjoying this and i guess you guys have these sessions every friday evening i believe which means then okay which means you don't have life every friday evening just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> okay yeah cool okay so um yeah so let's probably get started then and thank you for um yeah, so now I roughly know that you guys are mostly in, oh, can I ask as well, um, I suppose you guys are mostly in computer science, but maybe not all of you. So who are you are not from computer science major? Just curious. Ah, interesting. Can you sh uh, shout a little bit your major quickly? Just curious. Okay, cool. Oh, cool. Sorry? Computing engineering? Oh, computer engineering. Oh, got it, got it. Computer engineering. Yes, yeah. Information systems. Got it. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. So there's some diversity in the group. So I'm really happy because, to be honest, I think mm, software engineering nowadays have become almost like a bread and butter tools to be applied to a diversity of problem domains, right? I mean, there is no such thing called software problem do problem statements. I mean, I mean, yeah, you could you could build software to improve software engineering, but it's not usually how what people do in the real world, right? Usually, you build software for improving problems, uh, improving other domains. Could be in whatever, like B two C, B two B domains, uh, like in research and other things. So I'm really happy that you are here. And normally, great startups and great companies are created um, in collaboration between the tools domains or like the general capability domains and the specific domains in which the problem statements are in. So great to see a different diversity here. Not in gender though, but OK. <laughs> sure. Uh, sure, let's just get started then. Um, so. I purposefully ordered it this way so that uh, we start with the technical thing first and then build uh, bottom up towards from the from the prof from from the like software engineering towards what you build with it like company. Yeah, so um, 
just a bit of my background. I think probably like you already mentioned. So I guess I'm mostly known for being co-founder of Traveloka, but I guess I had quite a lot of background a bit. I work at Microsoft and LinkedIn in the US uh, after graduating from Stanford. And then um, came back to Indonesia to start Traveloka and stayed there for about seven years, bringing it like from zero to pretty big, I guess. Um, they are still there. I mean, they're still trying to IPO right now. And currently in the past three years or so, I've been in Singapore actually and started another early stage startup, but in a very different problem domains. I think I decided that I'm a lot more idealistic as a person and I couldn't, I just couldn't see myself working in e-commerce for the rest of my life to be honest. I think just have a lot of ambition on tackling like big problems in the world. So assembly is about solving productive discourse and open collaboration on the web. We are trying to build the kind of spaces like Twitter or Reddit, but design to empower substantive, productive, trustworthy discussions, which is people say is impossible. But I think we back to differ. And I think we have quite a lot of experienced people in the team, not just in tech, but in other domains as well in a distributed manner. And I think we try to crack it. So yeah, later on that note. Um, yeah, so for this session, I hope I can like tell some stories in case study format to give you a sense of how software engineering could play quite an important role in the real world. I guess for some of you who already works, then you might see how this plays out in your job. For some of you who haven't graduated, hopefully this can inspire you a little bit on you figuring out what you really want to do with your life. Uh, yeah, so let's um, start. These three case studies are quite different from each other. So I purposefully pick it that way, starting from a very big company like LinkedIn to, you could say, medium size. So I mean, the case study for Traveloka is when it was kind of medium size, and the assembly case study is at the current time when we are still early stage. Let's start case study one. Yeah, so um, you guys all know LinkedIn, I suppose, right? I mean, once in a while, LinkedIn was on also a very small startup in the year 2003, if I'm not mistaken. Started one year before Facebook started, pretty much. Yeah, and when I was there, it was already year eight. I think I was there. Actually, I was from 2011 to 2012, and they were still pre-IPO, was trying to go to IPO, and their user base was close to 100 million users, but definitely not as big as today. Today, it has 700 million something users, and it was still a purist platform at that time, meaning it focuses mostly on the network and leveraging all the metadata of what, of what people have submitted to LinkedIn and their connections and their interests and so on to basically hyper-target you with job ads or for recruiters to hyper-target candidates. Or technically they had ads back then, so they had some ads targeting based on your industry interest and so on and so on, but it wasn't as good as, as big as Facebook, let's say. Back then they did not have a newsfeed. So my team was part of the team who played around with the concept of news and dynamically rank interesting news for each user. And it did not even look like news feed back then. It looked more like some pages full of news with a lot of social signals. That was like their first iteration. And I was part of the team that built the data pipeline to basically pipe different data from all of our different parts of not just LinkedIn, but externally as well. So share embeds and tracking pixels and things like that are also data sources that we track. And actually not just this, but including scraping the news article web pages itself and trying to be able to detect where was where is the headline and text and then typing those through uh, topic tagging and then trying to match that with user use every user's industry and other interests and so on. So you can imagine there's like a pipeline thing 
from the web through LinkedIn metadata, and the output is personalized news ranking for each user. Okay, so if this if LinkedIn scale is small, then it's not that hard. I mean, you can imagine doing it in your head, but because LinkedIn scale at the time was already so big, like about 100 events per second or 10 million events per day, it became quite a hard problem. So how did we approach it? You could imagine that, okay, I mean, most of you are computer science students, right? So for, I mean, I hope the rest of you could follow a little bit. I will try to explain it in layman terms. So our normal way for doing a pipeline of events are normally by using message queue. You might already know some of these, right? I mean, um, but there are different flavors of message queue. The basic ones are like these, like Rabbit MQ, Zero MQ, if you heard of it before. Yeah, uh, yeah it's basically just a server that stores all the events that you publish. And on the other side, you consume those events. And you can configure it in different ways, like do topics, routing. You can like do a lot of things with configurations. Okay, but what's wrong with it? So, I mean, let's try implementing this. Well, it's not durable. <laughs> I mean, e the events are in memory, meaning if the machine crashes, the events disappear. Okay, that's not great. I mean, if you, I mean, well, in small scale, nobody cares. In large scales like LinkedIn, well, every second, every second of unavailability, we might lose 100,000 packets, let's say. That could mean a lot of things that have a lot of implications to user experience, revenue, and so on and so on. So on. I mean, it's a big deal, right? Um, but we just don't want to lose stuff in general. But well, can it be made more durable? Yeah, you can by rep replicas. This is the normal way that people deploy these queues, right? I mean, have multiple instances, send it twice. So if one crashes, you still have the other one. Technically that works. That's quite expensive though, because memory is not cheap, right? Uh, I mean, I mean, if you know, I don't know how much of you, if you are from computer engineering, I think one guy is from computer engineering, right? Uh, you might appreciate a lot more the difference between disk, memory, CPU cache, and so on and so on. And so on. The fastest, the fastest, storage you access like CPU cache or memory, the, the more expensive it is. So imagine storing every event twice or three times in memory is actually very expensive. Your infrastructure bills can rack up really quickly. So not recommending that in large scale. Yeah, so what to do then? I mean, okay, so let's try another solution. AWS SQS. So you guys might know this as well from your hacking projects, right? Well, 10 years ago, this did not exist, by the way. <laughs> so in LinkedIn, this was an, didn't exist. So um, how is this different from the previous one? Turns out it's not that different, except that the storage is in disk. But turns out that makes a huge difference because it's durable, right? You, you normally don't lose data in this, not as often, I guess. And it's cheaper, turns out, much cheaper. Yeah. So, yeah. So, SQS is a very popular service. Everybody uses it. I mean, very, very good. So, what's the weakness then? Why can't some companies like LinkedIn and Facebook just use SQS? Isn't that solving the problem? Turns out, again, depending on the scale, uh, SQS design is using one commit per message. So if you know databases, right? I mean, imagine that every operation of, let's say getting, okay, getting a message is usually batch. So you can get hundreds of messages at one time, okay. But committing, like acknowledging that, okay, I have processed message one, I have processed message two, I have processed message three, four, five, these are individual operations. So if you have like really, really high volume messages, like 100,000 messages per second, what happened, then it's quite expensive. Let's say even if you do batch, behind the scene, what's the disk doing? I don't know, the disk, they could do random disks all over the place, right? I mean, committing 100,000 states is quite expensive, however you wanna batch it. So if you have, I don't know, if you have played Radmin database before, Sometimes, have you ever experienced 
oh my query is so slow sometimes why is that interesting right and it's not often directly just correlated with data size it's not necessarily just that actually so sometimes you notice that if your query has a proper index it's really fast if you if you don't have a proper index it's very slow sometimes right and other things as well primary key matters and blah, blah, blah. why is that turns out because the disk is a very weird creature the disk is uh it's like a you know like physical disk are just like tapes right i mean it's not ssd but it's the same thing tapes where it kind of have a physical needle so whenever you read or write from it it will literally like read and write with that needle kind of, i mean it's like the old style disk meaning that if you have a database and all your data is scattered around the database without any proper ordering then any query would requires moving those needles of the disk all over the place and it has limitation it has physical limitation so you we cannot do that fast for doing random access yeah. if it's sequential it will be blazing fast like reading a big file one gigabytes file is super fast <laughs> but if we do random queries in the database it's going to be extremely slow yeah. so it makes a big difference turns out one commit per message makes a huge difference yeah so okay what's the solution then uh, okay continuing with the story this is pretty much LinkedIn, LinkedIn's invention. So the Kafka team was just started as a small team inside. I think companies as big as LinkedIn, Facebook, Google normally have a lot of internal teams working on internal systems like databases. Like LinkedIn have a few, like Kafka was one, Voldemort was one. And I, I think there is they, they do some kind of like tools on top of Hadoop to manage job workflows. I forgot the name, Azkaban, I think, Azkaban. And then there was just a, a bunch of projects. Some of them became open sources. Some of them became spin-off companies, as we can see later. So what is LinkedIn solution? Well, take the messaging model, like SQS model, but treat it as a stream with checkpoint. Yeah, that's, that's it. It sounds easy in concept. Uh, right so just like sqs you can send as many messages as you want read as many messages as you want but but we cannot support per message commit so basically if you read a thousand messages and you throw an error for one of the messages you just have to repeat just reread the 1000 messages so that's the trade-off but turns out it's fine actually i mean as long as the downstream components are designed to be idempotent and quite tolerant of this kind of yeah like at least once delivery i mean it's fine actually yeah so that's the design the checkpoint is a an o1 state very efficient yeah so uh but they also did extras so basically they add partition and this is not just replica it's different these are literally partitions with ids so you can set up produce like not producers but consumers targeting specific partition and sorry when i mention consumer here it's not just one machine right consumer could be a cluster of machine a partition here could be a cluster of replica partitions so i mean so i mean if you yeah 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 but it's specifically split that way why so that literally you can infinitely scale if you want so if you have super high throughput as you you need super high throughput of events just split the kafka um, thing yeah into let's say 16 partitions and then there are dedicated machine clusters consuming from each partition number one two three four five six this kind of like yeah so technically you could do that but and there are some extra things like routing and whatever that to be handled yeah. so technically you could deal with almost infinite throughput this way and with the streaming like mo method basically reading is like batch read and then move the checkpoint that's it that's pretty much the design yeah. and why it's so fast because in the disk there is no database there's no whatever in the disk it's all flat file 
it's one direction of flight funnel. Basically, like writing data from here to there, like running as fast as possible, and the reader also run as fast as possible from here to there. So it's very linear, very sequential, very fast. Yeah. So basically, this is what has been used in LinkedIn like forever. They're still using it. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't been there for a long time. I think, but I think I'm sure they're still using it probably. Um, yeah. And that's the story basically. And the aftermath is, I guess my team evolved into the newsfeed team, but I think it grew a lot bigger after, pretty much after I left. Kafka was spinned off actually as a company named Confluent, partially funded by LinkedIn. There was a news about this. I think LinkedIn chip in only quite little. They raised the first funding only like, I don't know, like a few million and LinkedIn chip in 500K. And they just IPO pretty much this company at the $8 billion valuation, I think. So like a pure tech subsystems like this could be a super big company. I think actually in the US it's quite, in the US and Europe, it's quite common. But if you think about it, companies like this can be built from anywhere in the world. Why not Singapore? I think you can do it too. Yeah, that's case study number one. Yes, yeah. thank you for, not, not, no, not me, but thank you for the Kafka team, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, cool, okay. Uh, okay, are you ready for the case study number two <laughs> and three? Okay. Okay. Or, or maybe like take a break a little bit. Do you, do you guys want to uh, ask maybe like any questions? Uh, oh, if you feel you want clarifications on any terms or things like that, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Yeah, okay, continue maybe? Okay, yay, okay. So case study number two is kind of like my own experience pretty much. <laughs> I think case study number two and three are both my own experience. Okay, so this was quite specific to Traploka, uh, my previous company, when it was still kind of small-ish, medium, small-ish, medium. Um, yeah, so to give a little bit of context, right? I think I'm sure you guys are all familiar with travel booking sites, and there's a lot of them, right? Expedia, Kaya, Priceline, blah, 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 blah. But what's the difference then? It was Traveloka just a clone for Southeast Asia or Indonesia specifically and other countries? But turns out almost with the exception that in the US and Europe, all the airlines and big hotel chains all have nice APIs that you can just consume, that's it. <laughs> And also everybody uses credit card. So by integrating inventories plus payments, you can literally just build your own travel sites. How about in Traveloka? So this was in the year, uh, Traveloka was founded in the year 2012. That was when I think the Indonesian startup ecosystem was very, very empty, very new. There was nothing pretty much. There was only Tokopedia. They just kind of started as well. Gojek wasn't even there. Gojek was a bit later. Uh, so Grab was kind of started around the same time at Traveloka, I think. It's very, very empty, basically. Um, and yeah, airlines, hotels, like they don't know what is this? Huh? I don't know. I mean, they are used to selling tickets literally through offices where you come in, input your data into a form and you pay with cash. And then they print out a paper ticket. That's how it was done. So, I mean, what is, what is, what is API? Like nobody knew. <laughs> yeah, so then it's a, an issue, right? So our only data sources were websites. They had like some rudimentary websites, like, right? But I mean, we actually don't scrape their, their customer websites. So we had this travel agent license and we got some login, user accounts and passwords to their B2B system. So meaning if you are a mom and pop travel agent with your own home office, you can log in with your username and password, book a ticket from for somebody else and print the ticket for them. That was literally what the system is because we need access to that system. Otherwise we cannot book, right? So if we only scrape the website, then I guess we can book. We can book, but we wouldn't get commission. Basically, like the rule was, if we want to get commission, we have to book through this B2B thing. 
So that's the only thing that we had. Then the question is, why couldn't anyone just scrape the hell out of it, basically? And all, first of all, the scraping was not easy at all because it's like quite complicated. Yeah, it's, it's just like very brittle, right? You can imagine like scraping is it's just very hard to manage uh, in general. Also not stable and their surface reliability is not, not, not that great. <laughs> so, I mean, it's very hard. Um, but turns out at our medium size-ish um, stage, we encounter another blocker, meaning that scraping cannot scale indefinitely either because there is a limitations on airline server their, basically their ability to process our queries. And there are different constraints here. Constraint one is the physical constraint. Their infrastructure literally could crash if we send too much traffic. But constraint number two is that because Traveloka was quite small at that time, so if we behave badly, they would punish us. I think they blocked us for a few times already. This is when we were small. Sometimes they block, completely block access to their inventories because we are seen as misbehaving or something. So those occasions happened in the past. Not now, I think. But uh, yeah, so basically uh, the problem is slightly different. This is not about scale, but about how to make the best of very limited bandwidth of data to serve as much traffic as possible with accurate and fresh enough inventory data. Because prices change all the time, up and down, right? So then you want to, if you could, you want to scrape live all the time, but it's not possible. So how do you cache something like that? Okay. okay, so, okay, sorry. Just for info, this is roughly what the scraping looks like, scraping logic. So um, to request, routes from a, for a pair of city, let's say Singapore to Jayapura. If you don't know Jayapura, Jayapura is literally the corner east of Indonesia. And Indonesia is a very long country, right? So, I mean, it's like the farthest you get kind of. Well, um, okay. If, if this is a US and Europe company with US and Europe inventories, it's very easy. You just connect to the API, they give you everything. But we cannot. We, we often have to assemble the routes ourselves. Let's say there are some direct routes that you can get right away, but there are a lot of indirect routes that you just kind of need to assemble it yourself. So then given our, I mean, there's like ways for us to predict good enough transit, transit nodes and so on to then do this fan out queries given a let's say given a transit Jakarta or Surabaya, then we just query the different likes, combine it, different likes combine it. So sounds simple, right? But imagine that even though, I mean, if all the data is in memory already, of course it's going to be very fast. <laughs> but unfortunately, each box requires connecting and scraping Ireland's website. And the latency could be anywhere between I don't know, two seconds to sometimes like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Sometimes it doesn't return, sometimes it time out. So anything could happen, really. Yeah, so, but I mean, we want to keep the user experience good though. So in the end, we want the latency to be, yeah, I think people would be patient enough to wait for five seconds maybe, you know, or something like that. So sometimes we cannot return the fresh data. Sometimes we have to sacrifice. Some parts of this might be timing out. So we just need to return whatever we can return. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. And each box might represent anywhere between five to 20 to 30 flights, maybe, you know? So if you cross this out, you can get hundreds of routes actually, depending on the pair side. Right? So, okay. So, but I mean, Traveloka was not that big, fortunately, at that time. Now it's bigger. So our query frequency was probably, I don't know, 10,000 query per day. So not, not that much yet at that time. Right now, it's probably in the millions per day. But yeah. So yeah. How did we solve it? Okay, well, we did not try this <laughs> because this is too risky. So um, some of our smaller competitors did this. They scrape for every query 
maybe that's the reason they stay small. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, so yeah. So then, okay. So come to the more obvious solution, which is doing caching. You guys are familiar with the concept caching, right? I think LRU cache is the most common form of it, meaning least recently used. But to be honest, later on, we don't exactly use LRU. We use kind of most likely to be stale. So that's different, right? Because each route staleness, I mean, each route frequency of change is actually quite different. So Jakarta, Singapore is like super crazy up and down, up and down. But with Jayapura, like who flies to Jayapura? <laughs> so I, mean, well, I mean, the price is stable, <laughs> mostly. So it depends. You can optimize it quite a bit. But let's say you have this. By the way, yeah, not, I have, yeah, not to mention, but, uh, <laughs> also, like we shouldn't attempt to even like do scraping to our land websites and then open the threads, you know, like, I don't know but if you are familiar with this, right? But I mean, if you do multi-threading thing, programming, there are different ways you can do it. But normally like a beginner, <laughs> like programmer would just open a thread, do something that takes a long time, wait and wait. Oh guys, it's, I mean, Okay, in small scale, it's okay. <laughs> As the scales gets large, like waiting on a thread is actually very expensive. In Java, a thread takes probably one megabytes of memory. I think. In other languages, probably a bit better. Like Go, we are using Go right now, right? I mean, Go thread is quite lightweight, I think. Probably like, I don't know, 10 kilobytes or something. But it's still some resource, like being used up. Yeah. But like, imagine you are using Java. Then you open a hundred threads or a thousand threads. All of the threads are waiting for our lens data. Then you exhaust one gigabytes idle, not doing anything. So your machine could be like completely like just like doing nothing and the resource is used up. So it's like it's not a great situation to be in, right? So first of all, it needs to be non-blocking ideally. So our code pattern is using callback everywhere. It's like send a query, use of course, need to use some to use the right library for this right? and then send the query with a callback that's it and the function terminates up to the front end it all terminates to the front end so the use what the user knows is well the user okay but they're okay they're different layers sorry it's getting a bit complicated but basically uh that layer terminates <laughs> yeah and later on that layer will get callback that's it Without that, we cannot scale. Like it's impossible to scale. Uh, okay, so let's say this is the obvious solution. What's wrong with this? Turns out there are some problems. Um, okay. Oh, I have mentioned this. Sorry. Um, waiting for scraping have memory footprints. Okay, but that could be resolved by smart callback. But turns out this is becoming a big problem too. Incidents of duplicated scraping. Meaning, let's say Jakarta Singapore route is very popular. And then if the cache has the routes, it's all good. And then it expires. And then all these parallel people searching for Jakarta Singapore at particular dates search for exactly the same thing in close, in close periods. And they all scrape for the same thing, right? So I mean, how do you handle that? Because everybody's still waiting. The result is not in the cache, cache yet. Right? So you will have duplicates scraping queries. And they all might return with the same thing. So it's quite expensive. So let's solve this. And then, OK, sorry, sorry. Uh, there's more code here. But this is our attempt to reduce duplicates. How do we do it? So. Let's start this slowly. Okay. The LRU cache now no, no longer stores key and value only, but it stores key, value, and a callback array. What is this callback array doing? But by the way, so if you do this, you cannot do Redis. You just need to rebuild your cache, basically. Because, I mean, Redis cannot do this, right? So just rebuild. And then uh, the callback array is just for 
anyone who wants data to register their callback there. So if the value is not there yet, at least I have your callbacks. I will call you if the result is ready. That's it. That's the concept. Of course, synchronization needs to be handled properly. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be a mess. Uh, so it's interesting, right? So we no longer say, hey, Cash, I want to get this value for a key. It's no longer that. But basically, hey, Cash, I want to get a sync <laughs> of value, but you don't have to return me the value now. You can return the value later through the callback. Call me whenever you are ready, basically. And then, and then we do this. Yeah. Append the callback. If the scraping is not yet running, then initiate scraping. Of course, plus synchronization, plus mutex here, of course. Otherwise, it's like race condition without the mutex, right? So yeah, that's it. So once the result comes in, everybody's happy. Basically, we just loop, loop for each of the for each callbacks call everybody with the same result everybody's happy so this solves quite a bit of cpu memory and so on so nice so is this it um yeah okay um there's some plus plus as well but yep the no more incidents of duplicate scraping there's some bonus here as well, basically. Sorry, I mean, sorry, there's too much code. Maybe, I don't know, do you, do you, uh, I'm curious if other speakers normally put code in their slides. So if they do that, I don't feel bad then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see. But yeah, but okay, but this is interesting, right? I mean, technically you can add a timeout. The timeout, so you can change the logic a little bit, right? So basically, Hey, I give you a callback. Call me if you have results. But I also set up a timer. And if you don't return the result to me and my timer already rings, I will return to myself with the old data. That's it. That's pretty much how you do it. So we can, we can basically get customers to always get result within five seconds, even, even if a lot of things take more than five seconds behind the scene. Because after five seconds, all the timeout rings. Whatever you have, just return it to me. Yeah, let's say. So, okay. And okay, I promise this is the last slide, but this is another code. But just want to give you some idea of the code, right? Uh, basically, this, okay, what is this code, right? Okay. This looks weird. Like, what kind of code is this? I don't even know. But, but this actually is basically literally just doing a two layer for loop. I don't know. Basically, sorry. imagine we don't use callback. This callback is messing up all the code, basically, right? If we don't use callback, how to get a route from Singapore to Jayapura? We just do two layer of for loop for each transit node. And then we iterate again. Okay, give me like A to B and give me like B to C. And then I will just combine it between like A to B and B to C. And then combine it. Yeah, across all the transits and return. This is doing the same thing, but because of the callback, it looks kind of spaghetti-ish. It's a bit hard to read. Actually, we had a lot of trouble debugging things like this before. <laughs> but basically, it's the same thing, right? For each transit, get data for leg one, leg two. The issue is that the data is not returned. So this function does not return. That's the only issue. So if this doesn't return, this doesn't return, how do you even get the result to then combine it? So then basically the logic needs to be moved into this magic like aggregation callback, join callback. So we move all the for loop logic inside there. Of course, with proper synchronization because it, all this like multi-threading. So the goal is whenever all these callbacks return, it all bubbles up such that the callback on the top will return whenever you guys are ready. So this function terminates immediately in one millisecond. Terminates, that's it. And things just wait. Whenever it's ready, it bubbles up. So, that's, so yeah, so most of our flight search code at the time 
looks like this, which is like kind of like not fun to work with, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's that's it. Yeah. And the aftermath was, I think, to be honest, I think there was a lot of luck as well when we did the startup. I think being one of the first startups, first generation startup in an emerging market gives you a lot of tailwind for sure, right? I mean, so there, there were not much competitions. So if you are a strong software engineering, like if you have a strong tech teams in the country, nobody else had a strong tech team in the country. So you just like run as fast as possible and you just conquer the market. But of course, nowadays, Indonesia is a very different market. It's very competitive. Like if you try to build something, there'll be a lot of competitors trying to kill you. So it's a very different market right now. <laughs> but back then we, was a, we were a bit lucky, I think, I would say. Um, so with the product technology plus Google keyword ads, we were pretty lucky as well. Nobody used Google keyword ads at the time. So the price per click were like, the cost per click was, I think, Initially, it was like, I don't know, like 40 cents a click or something like that. But, but right now, travel is one of the most expensive categories in Google Keywords ads, aside from legal, e-commerce, and things like that. So travel is probably number three or something, or the most expensive. And I think today, I don't have the data, but today it's close to like tens of dollars per click. So like $15 per click in Google. It's like super expensive, crazy. Back then, it was like below $1. Yeah. But so that, I think gave up a lot of boost in traffic. And after that, of course, we cannot rely on Google anymore, switch to other things, to our own app, try to give discount promotion, TV ads, blah, blah, blah. So I think there's a lot of wasted marketing dollars to be honest, but I think probably it was necessary. Yeah, and then got invest investments, became a unicorn in five years, which is pretty fast. But I think in emerging market, that's probably quite normal. Actually, unicorns are normally quite fast, I think, nowadays as well. So once a company hits a point in which the product really fits the market, usually just push, push as much as possible, right? I mean, if it's e-commerce, you push with advertising. If it's social product, then it's virality. Yeah, and if it's B2B, it's sales. So I think depending on the types of industries you push in different way, but usually once you nail it, you can push. Yeah. Yep, so still planning for an IPO right now, but yeah, so credits to many people, I guess. But I think I guess the code that I shown, I kind of brought it myself, I think, <laughs> but okay, <laughs> never mind. Not trying to praise myself, but no, <laughs> okay. But okay, cool. So this is the second case study. Hopefully it was quite interesting. Uh, Okay, take a break before, I, I don't know, any maybe like question or comments before we continue? Uh, yeah, hello, uh, my name is Zico. I'm also Indonesian. Uh, okay. I want to know, like, right, when, uh, when, start, when start focus started? 2012. Uh, back then, in 2012, what motivates you to come back to Indonesia to start a startup, considering uh, the infrastructure in Indonesia not so good? Uh, thanks. Okay, yeah, sure. I'll answer quickly. Thank you. Um, well, it's an opportunity, right? So normally when a market is very empty, you know you're not going to get competitors <laughs> because now you have so many competitors. But to, to be more honest, back then, basically only two people, myself, basically like my co-founder CEO at the time named Ferry, he was in the US as well. I think he, he worked at Microsoft and then he decided he probably liked business more and then start taking Chinese lessons, went to China and then uh, went to HBS after and then dropped out. Um, I think he and I talked quite a lot. He's always very entrepreneurial. Maybe like my style is a bit different. I'm very techy and nerdy from Stanford background. I think everybody's very nerdy. So I'm, I was exposed to startups as well. Mm. I think it's the combination of his, his ambitiousness. I think he was from a family business background. So obviously he knew business. For me, it was, I'm quite a stubborn person. I think meaning that from my young age, I rarely follow people or rarely just take people's words as is. I have to figure things out myself and I need, I need my own direction basically. So. I start, that's why I self-learn programming very early on, built a lot of side projects very early on since middle school, high school. 
So I know I always want to do something myself. Um, and I think my co-founder at that time convinced me that, you know, this might be the best time to start because it's so empty, but as a small team, we have a competitive advantage to be able to push through yeah. because other entrepreneurs would not think of approaching an industry from a tech solution. So we were part of the very early ones. So maybe we have advantage, just run. Yeah. But yeah, but of course, back then we did not have an expectation of big success or something. No, we did not, right? We just try it out. We just want to try it out. And I think we are very fortunate that it turned out quite well. Okay, hopefully. So yeah, thanks. Okay. Sure. There is a very popular like idea or concept uh, like uh, that I heard a lot in the startup community is about like building things that don't scale, right? Like about like how like in the like early stage of Google, like I heard like once like they have six months where Google search just doesn't like index uh, all the sources were like how about like Facebook in the early stage, basically just like have duplicate servers and each server running its own like for a specific school. And if you are like a Harvard student, you cannot log into a Yoast like Facebook account. I'm wondering like, uh, the problem is like uh, like so basically with, with what we've discussed so far is about scalability issues and wondering like do we like face problems first and we try to scale or do we try to scale from the start and then try to like so that later on will be like and what is the approach and what are the pro like context that uh, do these problems do emerge thank you yeah thank you for uh, the question so for so for you who didn't hear it so the summary of the question is a lot of people say for entrepreneurs do things that don't scale. And a lot of thing, a lot of times the things that make you hit product market fit in the beginning is not about scale, right? Because scale comes later. So how do you reconcile with focus on scale that we often hear? So I think you are absolutely correct. And interestingly, case study one was about scale, right? Basically LinkedIn hit a scale issue. Case study two was not about scale. I don't know, uh, did you realize? So meaning that, so if you look at the case study before, right? Uh, like a lot of these things, if you think about it, this is actually about user experience. It's not about scale. Yeah, because Traveloka was still quite small when this happened, uh, but the limitations of the industry at that time made it impossible to serve good user experience with what was available. So we have to, try to find like a better solution to break through that to still deliver good user experience. Yeah, maybe like another example that I would use is um, let's say, maybe like companies like Slack like or Notion or something, right? There are tools, right? So did they need to think about scale in the beginning? Maybe not that much, but the issue is if Slack was not as fast as Yahoo Messenger or Google Chat at the time, then nobody would use them. Or if Notion was not as fast and responsive and collaborative as Google Docs or Microsoft Words, then nobody would use them. Right? So there, there is a natural barrier of user experience, we could say, that a company has to go through, but unfortunately, sometimes it means hardcore engineering work. Maybe not necessarily about scale, but performance is probably one of the often encountered challenges. Or like Google is the same. I think Google is an interesting company too, right? Even though they started pretty much just applying this citation linking concepts from research to the web, but they win by being, by two things, I think. They, are, they were really fast and they were really relevant. So they innovate on both the IR side, just like the design of the search index using many things, TF, IDF plus page rank. And on the speed side, I think mean Larry, Sergey, not just two of them, but some of the early engineers were like hardcore optimization people down to the physical server level. So everything was very fast. So I would say that was super crucial in breaking through the market. And then the scale kind of comes later. Yeah, Hopefully. yeah. thank you though for the question, a good question. Yeah. Sorry, there's, there's this. Yeah, no. What do you think? Should we continue to case study three before maybe other question asked? Okay, cool, yeah. So case study three is 
quite different yet again, actually. Ah, this is closer to the Slack case, I would say. So Assembly is our early stage startup company right now. And even there are some team members here in the audience, but guess who, but okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so we have quite an ambitious mission. We want to enable productive discourse and open collaboration on the web, which people think are impossible to do, I would say. I don't know if Elon Musk agrees. He tried to buy Twitter. I'm not sure what he tried to do with it, to be honest. Uh, but of course, this ambition is quite large and long-term, right? I mean, in the beginning, we wouldn't suddenly launch to the mass audience. I think that's not a wise thing to do. I think every startup normally pick their niche, even though it's maybe small in the beginning. But if they have a really great fit with the product, it naturally spreads. Let's say a group of researchers in a very niche topics really are really happy because they can connect with some collaborators across the world and discussing super, super productively about this topic. And turns out this becomes an example of how research can be speed up to other groups. So other groups start to adopt it. And then governments look at it, oh, maybe we can speed up public policy feedback and then they adopt it. And then journalists say it and, oh, maybe I can bypass my media overlords and we can just self-organize, you know? So there are different ways things can spread, but we believe we want to make the web a lot more productive and objective and trustworthy place. Long-term, long-term. We don't start there, we start small. Yeah. That's in a nutshell. What's the challenge? Uh, this is interesting. Uh, turns out a product like this has such a high user experience barrier in the beginning, similar to Slack and Notion. They face really high barrier of usability too. But one thing we choose to have is a content format like Reddit. You guys know Reddit, right? Like threaded content format that also supports collaboration real time okay that sounds like okay that's like a bit scary even to think of building but sometimes these are needed in very structured endeavors such as research journalism public policies and so on uh, so at least I mean, the product is not just about this there are other features but let's say this is the basic how do we build something like this that's the question uh, okay, so let's start. So to give context, this is roughly the data model. I mean, very rough data model. Ready thread like with different metadata. The metadata could be anything, could be, I mean, in Reddit, it's upvotes, likes, or reaction. But in assembly, it's a bit different. The metadata is not it's not like likes or votes. It's more like calibrated trust score, types of posts. So types of posts could include like proposition, argument, support, feedback is very different. It's very academic, I would say. It could also include status of accepted, dismissed, pending review, and things like that. So the metadata is a bit different, of course, right? But it looks like this then we want to make it like Google Docs where people's edits show real time. Okay, that's the problem. Okay. How do we do this? Okay, I mean, okay, I'm actually, I'm gonna skip quite a lot of stuff because if I'm too detailed here, it's kind of, maybe it's going to be too long, I would say. Like people might ask, what do you do in the database? What's the, da the data model? What's the query like, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's too long. To, so I just skip over those. And also partly that's kind of part of the interview questions usually <laughs> for people who apply that. So, so we kind of omit that for now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, but let's say we figure out the database thing. Let's say it's done. We have a data model somewhere. We can query it efficiently. How to get it to be real time, concurrent real time? Okay. The, the obvious solution is do some kind of PubSub. There are components out there like Google, GCP, PubSub, whatever, right? Yeah. 
a PubSub is just a hub for some clients to subscribe and some other parts to publish something. So, and it could be broadcast, right? Some parts publish an event targeted for this subscriber, these topics, okay? and all the subscribers got the events. That's the idea. Uh, okay, so quite simple. Basically, just every time there is database change, publish, and everybody who are subscribed will get the change. Okay, simple enough, right? Uh, turns out, it's just, yeah, I mean, for, yeah. I don't know. These things are like non-trivial to build, basically, right? There's like there's super many counter cases and blah blah. But even the basic could be quite interesting to think about. I think the issues we are handling are mostly conflicts. I think conflicts. Uh, meaning, mm, well, conflicts can happen in many different ways. It could be that different users try to submit something that conflicts. Like in the Google Docs, you guys edit the same paragraph. It's conflict, right? Could, that, could be system issues. Let's say events are pushed, but it arrives out of order. Or maybe one packet lost. So the Google Docs, let's say, receive five packets, two of them are, are like in reverse order and one of them got lost okay okay how do, how do you do it luckily it's not that often so of course you could do things like fall back to refresh or something like that you can do that right but is there ways we can design this so that the system is as robust as possible and can get to a valid latest state even though sometimes it get invalid stuff Okay, turns out with this design, we cannot do this. We cannot even detect conflicts with this vanilla design. What we need is some kind of versions. Okay. So um, a version is just an ID, right? Whatever, a monotonously increasing ID. You can get the, a version from anywhere, from database, Timestamp is dangerous, so be careful about timestamp. It's not always unique. So if you want to use timestamp, please append some other unique thing like machine ID or maybe wrap the timestamp inside some class that they duplicate it, like for ID generator or whatever it is, right? There are different open source things that you can use as well. Uh, okay, so versions work quite, I mean, but simply, I think, basically, everything is labeled with version. The database have the single source of truth. Every, everybody else might have stale version, but that's okay. So every time the client talks to the server, they have to say, I am editing this, but last time I saw version three. And then the server can basically say, okay, Okay, uh, it depends. There's a lot of variation on the server logic here. I mean, depending on how you structure it. If the version is blank version like this, it's hard to tell sometimes. For example, I edit, I edit this metadata and I saw version three before. Can this be applied? So I don't know. Maybe the version, the server does not have enough information to decide sometimes. Because I don't know, like, will this metadata conflict? I don't know, I mean, have to check. And it depends on the design of the server too, right? I mean, with Git, Git stores every history, technically, or Git can recalculate every history of the repo. Right? So it can technically do some smart merging based on like, from the, like all other history and things like that. I think we decided that we cannot store histories for the most part. Because if this is going to be used by the mass, like Twitter, Reddit, Discord, and then you have like 10 billion events, I mean, and then you start history for everybody. Oh my God, it's like, it's like ridiculously big, like it's impossible. So I think we decide to not store history, but then how do we resolve conflicts? So with this design, the only thing that we know is that 
hey client, your version was not up to date. So I don't know if your update is valid. Maybe this will re override something. So I reject it and please refresh your data and resubmit your change. That, that could be a way to do it. Yeah. At least the data does not get corrupted at least. Yeah. And, but that's not enough. So you see there in the pub sub, events that are pushed to the client need to have version two because this is the way the client can distinguish is this event re reordered is this event stale you know like i mean yeah that's the way they can tell really uh, uh yeah so if there's duplicate event or whatever yeah the client could just ignore it or reordered event whatever if the client feels my version is newer than you, then I don't do anything. So that's an easy way to do it. Okay. So yeah, okay, so this is not bad, but yeah, there is still problems, I guess. I think the biggest problem here is most conflicts cannot be resolved basically because version is the only thing we have. Like, I don't know, reject, reject all the time. So, is there a better way without storing history? Because storing history is just impossible. Okay, so let's try and improve design. Okay, so I use some rainbow color here a little bit. Yeah, again, sorry for the code. And yeah, one person, like, yeah, some of you in the audience actually work on this, I would say. But well, you can guess who, but okay. yeah. Uh, so imagine that. Yeah, we want to resolve more conflicts if possible automatically. And we realize the post text and different metadata do not always change at the same time all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So technically, if somebody edits the text and somebody else try to update certain metadata, they don't have to conflict. So, and this applies to different things as well. So like imagine that in the platform, we support things like moving things around. So in Reddit, once you have a thread, the thread is static. But how can you do productive discourse if you cannot correct mistakes or you cannot restructure things? So we allow actually moving things around, restructuring things, deletion as well if necessary or yeah. So not everything conflicts technically, right? So um, even things that are a bit hard could be like reordering things within a parent. So let's say reordering things like, uh, but you know, like let's say we have table of contents with sections. Somebody move a section down. Somebody move a section up. How does that conflict, right? Uh, uh, so, so then, will that conflict? So that depends on how we model it. Sometimes it conflicts. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. So the more granular we model it, the more we can resolve conflicts and just auto merge. Yeah, so it's the same here. I think the idea is having more granular versions for the set of things that might conflict, increase the probability that we can just resolve it. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, text conflicts still happen here. Okay, but actually, yeah, in our data model, at least, we store the history of the text only and not everything else just as a backup. Let's see if we would end up doing that in the future or not, but yeah. Okay, so hope you roughly get it. Uh, and yes, the result is the auto merge succeed more frequently. And still, if it conflicts and it cannot resolve, say to the client, please refresh. By refresh doesn't mean really refresh, refresh, right? I mean, we just return 
return the return value through the operation. Hey, this is the latest node. If you want to try again, try again. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's roughly where we are. There are a lot of details omitted here, of course. I mean, um, like ID generation thing, handling mutations to make sure the mutations are not lost and things like that. But in principle, this is where we have gone to make Reddit with Google Docs like collaboration as close to reality as possible. Yeah. And the aftermath is a little bit different because we are still an early stage startup, of course, still in private beta testing with very niche early adopter groups. Even I think we still have a lot of homework in the design UI UX side of things. Even we are still hiring designers actually. So in case you guys like know connections who are really good and very sharp with really great user empathy design candidates, we are open to it. Sorry, sorry, self-promotion. <laughs> yeah, so stay tuned, it's gonna be a long journey. Yeah, so I think that's it, I think. Uh, pretty much those are the three case studies and maybe like some conclusions on the different case studies. Reflecting on this, so these are like just three points, conclusion that I had. I noticed significant breakthroughs normally got started by quite a small group of people. Every company that you love and every product that you use was started by a very small group of people, right? But not only the founding team, but even when they scale, you know, when, like when LinkedIn had to build Kafka, for example, or when Intraflocal, we had to just redo the way we cache inventories. This thing was started by just like a couple of people, just two or three people. Like you, did, you don't really need that many people to create breakthrough because oftentimes the essence of the idea is very simple. So that insight leads everybody else to come in and join the project. And normally the better your code quality and architecture is, the easier for other people to join your project. This is why if you notice frameworks like React.js or maybe Lucene for search engine and things like that, they are so popular because their abstractions are very easy to understand and very easy to use and very easy to extend. So I think that was the case as well with some projects inside LinkedIn at that time, I would say. So it became its own thing. Yeah. Yeah. And point number two, I would say, I think engineering breakthroughs can create a lot of meaningful business impact. Sometimes people feel that engineers are necessarily just on the behind the scenes, on the back end, trying to scale things, make things more reliable. And sometimes people forget that there is a relationship between how good you solve certain problems with breaking through certain barriers in the business. And you can actually get to the next stage because you solve some, just one or two problems that are crucial to unblock the company. Yeah. So, and point number three, I would say strong fundamentals help a lot. So I hope you ace your algorithm, your systems classes. <laughs> yeah, because I think, uh, yeah, some of the basics turns out to matter a lot at scale. In fact, uh, my last slide is about like ballot list of things that you can pay attention to when you're building systems. Sorry, it's a bit dense. <laughs> yeah. But I think sometimes people like, people just ignore some of this or underestimate how some of this play a part in building large systems. And turns out, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you are building a small project, then there is no bottleneck. Your CPU level is at 5%, 10%. Your memory is empty. Your disk is empty. Everything feels fast, right? But when you hit some scale, then you hit this bottleneck one by one, normally. And you have to solve how to solve it. Yeah. So I put, there are a lot of databases points there because that's 
seems to be just from my experience interacting with people this seems to be where people sometimes don't pay attention of what they put in the model or or how they use it i think a database could be super uh, super powerful if used the right way i would say uh, and there are many types of databases as well as you might know right and sometimes understanding what's happening behind the scene can help you use it the optimal way too so yeah and exactly one delivery i don't know sorry i'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that phrase like exactly one delivery so i think when building systems sometimes we think magically when component a communicates with component b with component c if they send one message the other side receives one message <laughs> So I think normally that's impossible in the real distributed systems. Usually you it sometimes get two messages or you get zero. But normally people can configure it such that you either you usually get at least one, one or two messages. But then you have to handle duplicates with idempotent operations normally. Sometimes one or zero works too, but it's normally for ephemeral data that you don't care to be as precise. Let's say counting likes if you lose one likes that's probably i mean it's not nice if the like is from a particular user but if the likes are from the rest of the web who you don't really care then you can lose one likes probably <laughs> uh yeah and other things i guess state transition states states the state thing you know it's not fun let's say when you deal with a million flight tickets and flight booking going on in parallel and then 0.1 percent of those have illegal state in the database that's actually quite a lot you know so i mean so sometimes this thing matter at scale so uh, yeah because 0.1 percent of 1 million flight booking is 1000 flight bookings so you will get 1000 angry customers if their status is not clear is it actually paid or not is it booked or not you know, so in large scale i think this clarity of states transition needs to be like robust with a lot of unit tests for every state transition so yeah and yeah and other things don't ignore errors <laughs> this thing is yeah you know errors are i consider logging errors and alerting us of errors as a learning feedback loop about the system logging errors and monitoring is the way the systems tell us there is something broken inside there is something that is not quite right inside if we are missing that feedback loop we don't know what to fix so super important i think that's it uh that's it for now yes and we can do like general q a i guess before we eat so thanks all Uh, first of all, a uh, very, very thanks to you for uh, sharing your story and uh, going through all these three case studies, which was really interesting to know for all of us. So I'm a bit curious to know more about your journey. Like you uh, launched a startup in Indonesia, serving or filling a unique uh, or mar market or offering a unique thing, which helped you tap a huge opportunity there. And uh, it also helped uh, Traveloka capture a huge market share uh, right at the start. And uh, you made it into a unicorn as well in a short span of five years. So how hard or easy was it for you to uh, leave Traveloka? That is something that you built uh, from scratch and that is something close to you. And then join assembly out here in Singapore. So. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think this question probably fits for session two, but I'll answer it anyway. <laughs> because session two is about tech entrepreneurships, correct? Yeah. So, well, by the way, Traveloka and Assembly are companies I co-founded, so it's not like so I started separately both of them, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think it was very different. The me at age twenty and me at age thirty, if I look back, I was quite a different person. I would say. I think my values and ideals are probably still the same. But at age 20, just like a lot of you are around age 20-ish, right? I think there is so much 
there, there is so not that much baggage in life. Basically, we have nothing to lose, right? I mean, we just got started in life. Everything is possible. Even if we fail, what's the risk anyway, right? I mean, we can get a job. If we are smart, if we are good, we'll get a job just fine, right? And then we don't have kids yet. I mean, I did not have kids yet. Even I still don't have kids. I mean, I just get married. I just get married a few weeks ago, actually. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but at that time, I think the, my mindset was, I wanted to be where I could get the most intense experience possible. I want to accelerate what I know, like my knowledge, my practical skills, and so on, as fast as possible. So actually, I worked at Microsoft before. I found it a bit boring, I would say. But that was, for some reason, the only interview I got when I was there. So OK, sure. And then I moved to LinkedIn, which, which was a lot more fast-paced at that time. It was still a medium-sized company. And Traveloka obviously was very fast-paced. Uh, but wh why I left is an interesting question. It's a very long question as well, but it's like quite complex. But I think the short answer is there was some misalignment between me and the rest of the co-founders and the board, pretty much, I would say. So it has evolved to be a different company from what my ideals of a company should be like. I mean, it's still doing fine, right? I mean, it's fine. I mean, just like many other e-commerce companies, probably fine. It's just at some point, the spirit of really solving some fundamental problems and make breakthrough in society got lost a little bit. And the focus was about top line numbers, bottom line numbers. I mean, and it's healthy to be honest, for a company where, when growing to care about those numbers, it's healthy. But the misalignment I felt was when these metrics are not what's best for users anymore, but this is what will sell if the company try to do more fundraising. That means that certain metrics would be weighed out of proportion sometimes, sacrificing some other metrics, which actually helps with company health in the long run. It makes users happier, it makes the use unit economics better, and so on. But just the overall pressure of a company with fast growth is that you want to sustain this momentum and you are willing to spend as much money as you can just to provide an impression that you keep growing fast but there will be a limit on its sustainability at some point. Uh, so, and it shows, I would say, if you look at the unicorns in Indonesia, at some point, it could be partly because of COVID as well, but I don't think so, because in COVID people shop more for some reason, but there was a moment of plateau a little bit. And today is a moment of plateau, right? I mean, you can sense the market is correcting a little bit because there will be a limit on, how people can expect continuous growth because there are natural limits of markets, right? Indonesia has a GDP and GDP per capita. Singapore also has GDP and GDP per capita. However, extrapolation you want to project, there will be a natural limit of how big is the market segments you are serving. And then, I mean, if you want to be efficient as a company, the question could be, how can I, I mean, I eventually tap into these markets, but how can I optimize my unit economics to be, at least I'm efficient there. And if I want to grow more, perhaps I need to find a different problem statements that we can make fundamental breakthrough in so we can get our own mode there. So long story short, I felt the entrepreneurship spirit was gone pretty much. And maybe in the co-founding team, I would say I'm the only nerdy one, I would say. A lot of, I mean, the other co-founders have technical backgrounds too, but they came from family business backgrounds. The other executives in the company right now was mostly consultants and business people too. I felt my energy is best spent somewhere else, to be honest. Yeah. Like, the problem mission statements that we are working on at assembly i think is a problem statements worth investing in for many 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 years because 
it's an important problem statements. And as we talk to people, especially those who are experienced in the media, journalism industry, research industry, they really want something to change on the web, but they just don't know how. And people know it's a very hard problem, right? Huh? But who will work on it pretty much? And it's hard. Turns out if you look at, so some social, many social media companies are started by second time entrepreneurs, interestingly, like Slack or maybe not WhatsApp, not WhatsApp, but uh, Telegram, I guess. Telegram is a second time founder. Discord is second time founder. Clubhouse is second time founder. I think Facebook was not there. Like Mark Zuckerberg just started in the dorm room, right? Uh, but it was also a quite a lucky break as well. That's actually true. That's actually true. I, but I think it's, I did not consider them as companies though. I think Mark Zuckerberg started quite a lot of things, even included like class notes, right? I think in Harvard, like class notes and then some hot or not thing, you know? So like he created random stuff before creating Facebook to be honest. <laughs> but I consider that as a part of his natural being. He just wanted to create something, you know? I think I have a little bit of that too. That's why I created a lot of side projects since like middle school. Uh, but um, sorry, coming back to the second time founder thing, I, I feel that I'm in a position of relative privilege to other entrepreneurs because, so let's say I liquidate pretty much like all my Stravoka shares. So we have quite a healthy bootstrap fund, basically. So we basically can say, if we know this is a long-term problem statements, we can choose which VC we pick, which backers we pick, which advisors we pick. And we don't have to have to beg for money or take anybody's money and for them to impose how we run the company, let's say. Because they will for sure be influenced in what the company thinks is important depending on the personalities of the investors. Yeah. So we have the privilege now to be able to take an ambitious problem statements, have a very healthy runway to get to a point where it can be venture funded later, but it does not have to be our only North Star metrics because we believe there are other more important North Star metrics to safeguard, basically. So that's where we are right now, pretty much. Yeah, but I wish Stravloka and other companies could be the best of luck as well. And they're almost IPO anyway, probably, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. I think that fits session two questions. <laughs> Sorry, but you guys feel free to ask about more technical and fun questions too. Heavy questions are fun too. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for sharing. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm curious because like, uh, based on your three case studies, uh, I think it's kind of seem to represent like three different parts of your life. I guess when you were back at LinkedIn and then like Traveloka and then now at Assembly. I'm curious uh, whether, I, I don't know whether you chose that on purpose or not, but like I'm curious how do you think they have like interconnect uh, to, I don't know, based on like your experience, how they affect like, I don't know whether, I don't know if they really have like any connections, do you think? <laughs> I see. Interesting. Thanks. Okay. But I guess I take the question as probably a general question of connecting the dots, probably. Is that okay? Interesting. Does it represent three stages of my life? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I would say, in summary, when I was at LinkedIn, I was at age 23, probably, I think. So my first job was at Microsoft right, back then. But I would say my transformation as an individual started at Stanford probably because that was my first study abroad experience and my first living abroad experience. Basically, I never really lived anywhere else but in Jakarta. So I just you don't know. Right? 
even my English was quite terrible at that time, I would say. Yeah, so I mean, uh, my SAT's English score was quite bad, but I aced the rest, like the math, physics, blah, blah, blah. But my English SAT is uh, not good. <laughs> so I'm not sure why, why they admit me, but okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, I would say when I was around age 18, 19, 20, I would say I was a lot more guarded and a bit more anxious and guarded, I would say, because I did not know where I fit in the world. I only knew Indonesia throughout my life, right? So the first time I met all these different people from different walks of life, and they all seem very smart and blah, blah, blah. I wonder a bit sometimes, actually, because I was always a rebel when I was in Indonesia as well. I think I kind of didn't like the education system. I just like learned everything by myself, whatever, right? So and then, oh, in the US, I met a lot of some people who seem to be more like me. They are also very independent thinkers and so on, but they're also very different. They seem very polished. They seem very well-spoken, blah, blah, blah. So I think I was a bit lost, to be honest. So at that period of my life, I was very risk averse, I would say. So let's say, why did I not think of applying to other companies besides Microsoft, for example? I don't know. I think it's because I was risk averse. So I was in a scholarship as well at that time from an Indonesian foundation, and they require minimum GPA of 3.5 or something like that. So I was very scared because I need to ace my classes. Otherwise, the scholarship are going to be like taken away from me or something like that. So basically, I was in a bit of scared myself at that time. And I just want to make sure I get H1B visa, blah, 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 blah. So I kind of like not take as much risk. But from the Microsoft experience, which was a bit boring, even though it was interesting. I think I work on the .NET framework code base, actually. So it was quite interesting, but it was a very slowly moving code base. So it was quite boring. And at LinkedIn, it was more exciting. It's the closest I got to a real startup. Not really, it's big already. So maybe like meeting my co-founder at the time was, oh yeah, hmm, okay, you like to really think about like just starting a business, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that rev up the energy a little bit. I would say the day I made the decision that maybe it's okay to just like quit the job in the US and try something up, even if it fails, if I believe I'm really good, I can always get a job at another US company anyway. You know, so it's not really a big deal. I think that is another switch, but even I don't think I switch completely. It's gradual, right? So when I started Traveloka, I think I still approach it like a project, not a company yet. I think it took probably a couple years before I realized oh, we are on our own here. If something is broken, it, if customers are angry, if there's a problem, it's all our, our own fault. It's not anybody else's fault. So I think the sense of entrepreneurship probably got built somewhere along the journey of Traveloka that I really need to own this. This is my fault if it doesn't work, basically. Yeah. And I think that shapes me quite a bit gradually that probably... But I also learned quite a lot of things along the way too, right? So because I learned everything about basically business, product, marketing, engineering, general organizations, HR, legal, how to deal with investors, term sheets, blah, 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 during that period. So I feel graduating from that period, I feel quite different in a sense. I have a lot of confidence and knowledge across many domains. I mean, I am still not an expert in many domains, but I know enough to be able to ask somebody to help or join the team or inspire somebody that I feel I'm confident to tackle, just pick a very difficult problem to, to the limit of my ability. I wouldn't, I probably shouldn't take too hard of a problem, but I think, I think my capacity is really high. So I don't, high enough, let's say. So let me pick a problem within my capacity that I can do with resources as well, with knowledge, with teams, blah, blah, blah. And let's do something that you will not regret at the end of your life. That this is an important thing that you are glad you tried it. The focus is not success or failure, I would say, but the focus is solving this big problem. If the problem is so big, maybe it takes longer to solve it. Maybe there will be more failures along the way. That's okay. That's because the problem is so big. But it really excites me to be able to tackle a really big problem. 
And if we really try our best, I think the outcome will take care of itself later, but that's not the focus. So yeah, I don't know if that kind of provide a summary of how I was different in these three different stages of life. I'm not sure. I'm still young. I mean, I'm, I'm not like old or anything. Right? I mean, you guys are young, but I think sometimes people remind me that I'm actually still young too. I'm only like 34. Okay, that's old. Huh? Okay. <laughs> but some people think it's also young. So, okay, you can still live till 40, 50, 60, 70. There's still quite a long time to live. Huh? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm sure it's going to be a fun right? I think. Yeah, I think um, if there's no further questions, we can give uh, Duranto a break, like five minutes, then we can go on to the final session. Only five minutes? I thought we can eat something. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Feel free. <laughs> if there's any. Yeah. Again, all. I hope you are not sleepy yet. I guess. So I think I was told that Usually, the sessions ends by 9 p.m., but I guess this is almost 9 p.m. already, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay, let's see. I'll try to yeah, be efficient, but, but questions are always welcome, though, because yeah, I think this one is probably more chill because this is mostly about not exactly life stories, but it's more about the life of an entrepreneur, I would say, so a bit different, not as technical. Okay, so, okay, let's just get started. Um, oh yeah, I guess we can just skip this, but I just add more details. I think I consider myself quite stubborn and nerdy person since young, to be honest. I think I started programming at age 10, just learning by myself, picking up QBasic and Pascal and things like that. I started and doing my game development thing since age 14 or something. But I think I started quite early on and competitive programming, obviously, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, so here I am. I guess we can probably skip skip this. Oh, there was a funny story at Stanford. I guess it was the first time I was in the US, right? And also, it's Stanford is very entrepreneurial. I think in my freshman year, like one of my classmates asked me, hey, do you want to build a startup? Do you want to just like build a startup? I don't know. So I think, I don't know. I just did not know what the startup was or like, what do you mean build a startup? Do you mean like, how do you do it? You know, like just build something or something? I don't know. So like, I was just like a bit, there needs some to be some adjustment period when I was there. <laughs> and then I got tried to get recruited multiple times and so on and so on. So it's interesting. Yeah. So let's just skip this because it's boring. Okay, so this session is probably quite simple, just about the general questions about tech entrepreneurships. Let's start with the basic, because sometimes people are not super aware about the basics. Like, what is a startup and tech startup? And well, people know a startup is about starting something from zero, normally, to build a product, a business, a service, whatever it is that you are building. So I do have some friends in research in politics and and sometimes political party could be a startup actually. Let's say the, the Green Party in the US is a very small party. It, it is a startup technically. Right? And research institutes like AI Singapore next door, it was a startup. It was just started a few years ago as an initiative within government, right? So a lot of things are startups in the beginning. Uh, and why this is special? Because startups are meant for creating, normally creating discontinuous progress. If it's not discontinuous, meaning if it's just incremental, making something a little bit better, well, why don't the big companies do it? Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they can always make something a bit better, right? You, you don't need startups. But startups is needed normally because you believe something needs to be different in the world. It's not just a little bit better, but it's different. So big companies will not pursue it. So you have to pursue it yourself. So it's discontinuous or disruptive. Yeah. And specifically for tech startup, which I like, that's why I'm still a tech entrepreneur, is because you can create massive impact through your superpower. Tech can be a superpower 
to create massive scale impact with superior unit economics. Basically. So imagine the world before software. What do you do to create a large business? Well, you have to establish an office, you have to do marketing physically, maybe through through brochures or like through like whatever TV, blah, 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 blah. And then you have to set up operations. So if you want to scale from 1,000 to 1 million users, your operational cost per user is so high that, that you have to get bank loan, blah, 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 just to scale to 1 million users. Tech is very different, right? The marginal marginal operating cost is close to zero. You just pay a little bit more server cost. That's it. So tech startups are amazing and they grow very fast because of it. There's like zero marginal cost. Yeah. So yeah. And okay, sorry, this is a bit technical again, but even not all startups are the same. They are quite diverse actually. Some startups are trailblazers the Tesla, the SpaceX of the world, where, but you can argue that, um, let's say um, some social products are probably trailblazing too, like Instagram, for example, even though it does not seem as serious as Tesla, but it's something new. And some SaaS tools like Notion or Google Docs, oh yeah, wow, I never, people never imagined they could collaborate on Docs real time. Oh, that's something new, that's zero to one. So some startups are in zero to one, but they are very high risk normally, but high reward. Because if you can solve a zero to one problem, you own the market pretty much. And everybody has to catch up. Then the, another common, the more common one is, I would say one to N, making something better. Could be better, cheaper, more accessible, blah, 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 blah. So there's a lot of these things. E-commerce, you can argue, well, Amazon was probably zero to one because it was never done before. But nowadays there are so many e-commerce, right? I mean, there's e-commerce a little bit like this, a little bit like that, a little bit like that. Technically they are solving some niche market segments problem a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. Or let's say with FinTech companies, they make financial services a bit more accessible to more and more audience. So they are making somewhat more incremental contribution, not zero to one, but still quite important. So the risk is a bit lower for this category, but the reward is a little bit lower. A little bit lower meaning if you are successful, you will still have a lot of competitors. So you still have to spend quite a bit of marketing dollars, compete on price, blah, 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 blah. You can still go big, but the profit margin is also quite small, usually. But that's okay. And maybe the last category here is more like the Traveloka kind, maybe, and emerging markets kind. A lot of them are clones sometimes. Maybe not perfect clones. Sometimes there are local specific challenges that you have to solve. And maybe you are the first solving it, sure. But a lot of them are clones, really. <laughs> And it can be high reward, but it can be a bloodbath normally, depending, right? Uh, if the product is easy to build, you will, you'll be sure it's going to be a bloodbath because if it's easy, everybody's doing it. So everybody will try to kill you. <laughs> if the product is harder, then you will get, you have, you'll have fewer competitors. So it's a bit nicer if the product is harder. So yeah, so there are many flavors. There are other things as well. Network social is, it has its own thing. It's like a bit complex, its own thing. Like to build something like Facebook, you know, it's like very non-linear, you know, like it's all over the place. It's like very different. Twitter, very different. So um, yeah. So not all startups are the same. But are there commonalities? Well, yeah. The what are the ingredients of startups that become successful? I think some of these are, commonly repeated as well out there. So you might all know the terms product market fit, right? And product market fit is very simple in concept, but very hard to get. Basically, it's when a custom, customer, some customer base in their brain believe that your product is the best solution for some jobs to be done. If you can get there, you're, you're good. But it's super hard because 
imagine I don't know like if you go to grocery stores and pick some goods how many of those items you have in your brain that you know you need that brand right so I mean maybe most of you forget what the brands are right like it's not top of mind so you treat all of them are not that different it's all the same so all of them don't really have strong market position because even you you forget what they are <laughs> it's really hard to get there but once you get there you can own the market pretty much mm. yeah and second one i would say probably competitive advantage i think it's hard to be successful if the startup team does not have some special secret sauce to get there so if it's generic and the same with everybody else then it's quite unlikely they will win the market normally uh, so investors try to find signals that you are unique usually oh technically i'm angel investing too yeah in my spare time so then i look for these things too yeah including for my startup too i at we try assembly needs to have this too so yeah so it's all the same and then maybe the last one is execution the last but not the least um a lot of startup failures are because you know there are many many causes of startup failures right of course right i mean but if you just look at why startups fails a lot of them are because okay they give up but give up sometimes not because of because they want to give up but because they run out of money i think it's quite common so they have not find product market fit or they haven't figured out how to scale they haven't figured out unit economics they have and then they run out of runway but you know normally if you have enough convictions normally you can convince somebody usually but in a lot of these cases sometimes the team just get burned out i think it's quite normal too to be honest if you are working for many 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 years in a problem and it's very painful and you are not getting there it's like oh what are what am i doing with my life right so i mean there will be a lot of things like that but this is i think where passion about the problem domains matter because if you really love the problem domains you will keep working on it but some but just opportunistic oh i just want to follow because follow the other people like i this seems sexy i want to work on it these people will give up the first normally because they underestimate how hard it is when they get into it so, so execution is super important too you have all the ingredients but you have to just go <laughs> get there huh. yeah um and then about the team I, I would say founding team i think the terms founding team is a bit loose it does not always mean founders i think it's normally means founders plus plus crucial people that you need in the team to make this work i would say i'm looking for this as well and i think yeah and i think this is mentioned many times as well in different vc blogs and whatever sometimes people look for obsession i mean obsession is not that positive of a word but basically let's say this is some startup that is starting from zero you don't know it doesn't have anything right how can you tell this small team are going to be the one who will run as fast as possible and never give up for many 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 years until they win how do you know that it's very hard to judge right how can you tell even so normally people try to get proxy for it such as obsession it's like it's a weird thing i don't even know how to but sometimes you can tell by how passionate somebody is sometimes you can tell or obsession could also be reflected on how they have spent their time let's say during their work somehow they keep thinking about the problem and they keep doing this side project again and again and again they keep like you know? so you can tell that this person really wants to solve this problem <laughs> yeah and normally that's reflected on depth as a meaning that when you ask that person about that problem that person have explored so many things all the corner cases all the different ways blah 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 and all the competitors blah, blah. so the person can tell you so much about the problem statement like they have done the research because they are so obsessed about it so usually you can tell through that yeah and then yeah and then entrepreneurial characteristics it's hard to categorize i think but you can tell as well when somebody is very you know like just 
a go-getter. They really want to get somewhere. They really want to learn as fast as possible. Very resource, resourceful, persistent, blah, blah, blah. So you can tell when you meet these people. Maybe you are one, you know, so like you can tell as well. Maybe it could be built over time. Maybe, I don't know, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. And then I would say the other skill sets are almost secondary. If you are so obsessed about the problem domain and you are so persistent, there is high likelihood that you can convince your friends to join you, especially your friends from a different background and different fields to join you. So usually the third problem solves itself because you have number one and two. Yeah. But if you also have the skills, that's great. You can just start prototyping if you have the skills. Yeah. So, yeah okay. So roughly speaking, this is. I don't know, whatever. Uh, okay, this is maybe second to last thing. Okay. And then, so what? So let's say you have great ideas, team, you have perseverance, uh, like whatever. And then, so what? And then we get to the journey. And sometimes people mistaken what a startup journey is like. So I have like five points here. Number one, people think people pursue their passion and that's correct i mean i would say people pursue their passion in the startup but not because it's enjoyable this is weird but because you believe in it so much that even if it's painful you still move forward that's the mindset <laughs> yeah even if it's not enjoyable because it's so important that i don't care if it's enjoyable or not so or, yeah and then maybe like point number two is interesting. Uh, I would say if you look at some of the most successful companies today, don't look at how popular they are today, right? Of course, today they are very popular. Re reverse time to 20 years ago, where Airbnb just started. Or when, okay, Facebook, I think, get was quite lucky in the beginning, so it just grew. But okay, let's pick Airbnb, let's say. Or Twitter, or maybe Slack was weird. Slack started as a game company, if you know the history, right? And then the game failed, and then they pay for to chat, I'm saying, yeah. But if you look at Airbnb or Twitter or whatever, Airbnb got so much rejection from VC because everybody thinks they're so dumb for renting mattresses to other strangers. It's the worst idea that was so now those feces probably regret it now, but I think they got so much rejection because they think it's a very dumb idea. So that was basically it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's true for many, many different ideas too, especially the zero to one kind, maybe, right? For the incremental ones, maybe it's okay. Yeah. But turns out these ideas was not popular in the beginning. So it's weird. So it seems that you need to have courage to pursue something that people think sound dumb, but inside you believe, oh, this can actually be really big. People just don't see it, but it actually can be really big. Yeah. So that's what you need to face. <laughs> yeah. So, and then number three, actually, yeah, number three, I think it's similar to number two. Again, looking back, these are not famous, famous. So sometimes we think, Oh, you know, oh, Elon, Elon Musk is so famous because I don't like, it's so I don't like, or like doesn't have to be Elon Musk, so other people, like whatever, Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, like Larry Page. When they started, who are they exactly? You know, like maybe they look like you, like who, you know, <laughs> who cares? So, so Larry Page or Elon Musk or whatever su is successful not because there were Elon Musk back then. So let's say you are Elon Musk, let's say, right? And then you just, Okay, Elon Musk is a second time founder, so he just exited from PayPal, pretty much, right? Uh, but you are still nobody, right? Nobody know who's Elon Musk again? I don't, I don't know, who's, who are you? And then if you go to a VC meeting and pitch like, oh, who are you? I don't know you. I only know Yahoo founders. Yahoo founders are very famous, but who are you, Elon Musk? I don't know, who's this guy? So nobody knows you, right? So I mean, that's the, that's the situation back then, basically. And then people got famous a lot later. But that's that's the that's the reward much, much later, right? No. Yeah. Okay, and then point number four. People also sometimes think of associating startups with freedom. I can control what I do, I can control my own time. I think that's correct. That's correct. 
but it's very similar to choosing who you marry, you know, because you also have freedom, right, to choose who you marry, right? You can pick, I don't know, it's like, yeah, people around you, oh, this girl is hot, whatever, uh, whatever, I mean, up to you, yeah, but, well, but unfortunately, the very freedom that you have make you responsible for the many decades of implications of your choice, right? Yeah, so then, once you pick a person, what if in year three, you, you realize you don't like the person? What happened? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Life is long. So what to do? I don't know. But the startup is the same thing, right? Because a startup is like a baby. It needs to be given time to grow. And sometimes it's a struggle, right? I mean, pivots, blah, 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 building products. Blah, blah. So if people change their mind too much, like, oh, I'm bored with the startup after two years, then it will, obviously it will die. <laughs> like you cannot do that, right? So by picking your own startup, you commit to it at least to a lifetime long enough for you to be able to grow it, to be successful. So it's actually more commitment, uh, almost like marriage, but maybe slightly shorter. It's like only seven to 10 years, not 50 years, but seven to 10 years is quite long, right? So <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, and then last point is probably a bit tricky to understand, but I think people feel startup is fast. Okay, but that's correct, but not in the way that you think. I think people feel if you are in a startup, you will feel like you are in a roller coaster. Everything is growing fast, blah, 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 blah. blah. But you know, the reality is you are also running really fast but the fast the what is fast is iterative failing pivoting learning pivoting learning pivoting learning that's how fast you need to be so that fast is not about like running as fast as well it's not like that but the fast is like doing reps high intensity training and do it all the time because in each iteration you learn something and you build your muscle a startup is like that so it's not fast i would say it's intensive and the fast growth will come later after you do the necessary discipline of being intense at your development so yeah so this is kind of like points that demystify startups a bit i don't know hopefully hopefully this does not scare you <laughs> or something uh, yeah if you're not discouraged yet i guess you might be a founder material so <laughs> yeah but and but this slide is is the last slide, I guess. Well, but life is long, so no need to worry. You have a lot of time. You are still very young. Even I'm still young. People think I'm still young. You know, like 30 is like, I still have like 40, 50, 60. I don't know. So, yeah, so there's a lot of opportunities to learn. But I think if I could give advice, nor I think people would also give advice to seek an intensive learning ex experience. So like a boring job is probably not the best choice. That was what I realized at Microsoft as well. It was a bit boring. Even though the .NET framework code base was very interesting. I think I learned really good design patterns practices from there, but it was boring, unfortunately. So yeah, so, uh, yeah. I think big, medium, small companies, if you pick the right team, you can get really good learning experience. Really, you just need to pick. Um, yeah, take risks when you're young, I guess, because you might not get another chance later on or the risk taking yeah uh well i don't know because netflix founder was 50 years old i think when he started so maybe there is another chance so <laughs> yeah. and then the eureka moments can strike when you're ready meaning uh you know i think even mark zuckerberg like i think that guy said that mark zuckerberg did not come come up with social networks ideas right away right he built a bunch of random projects, to be honest, but something strike like, and if, if you listen to Mark Zuckerberg's podcast, he did not even think he's going to build a big company. It was just fun, basically. So he kept doing it because it was fun. It's mostly that. But turns out it gets really, really big. Yeah. But I think a lot of startup ideas are not by design. A lot, of, a lot of startup ideas usually come to you when opportunities hit. And sometimes it because the more experience you have, the more exposure you have to different industries, domains, problem statements. So you are more 
prime to be able to identify ideas, right? Because if you are still very green and young, if somebody say something, it's hard to tell. Is that a great idea? Is that a dumb idea? I don't know. I don't know. Because I don't have enough experience to contextualize what that people say. Yeah. But the more I have context, I can tell. Oh, okay. So yeah, I think it was right, probably. At whenever you are in your life. <laughs> and maybe the third, I would say, not to be underestimated. I think nowadays there are people who just want to start a startup right away or whatever, right? But I would say, you know, my experience working for a couple of years before the startup is actually really helpful. I, think. I see how companies run. Some parts of it are run well. Some parts of it are run not very well. So I can see. And then LinkedIn and Microsoft are quite different. Okay, in LinkedIn, they are very fast-moving teams. There's a slow team. Okay, oh, yeah. just like interesting. Like I just like learn patterns there. Also, I guess the savings are not bad. So imagine this, right? So I worked for a couple of years in the US and then I saved most of my income, came back to Indonesia and the living cost, I don't know, I don't know how much you know Indonesia, but Indonesia GDP per capita is one tenth Singapore. It's a very poor country. So I mean, if you are not aware, sorry, but it's developing, it's developing, it's developing, yeah. So pretty much my living cost when I started Traveloka was probably at most, at most probably like, 5,000 SGD a year at most, at most, at most. And imagine if you get US salary, you save a lot, you live in Indonesia, you can really stay quite a long time. Yeah. So just that runway and ex experience too, it's really helpful sometimes. So yeah, it make you not, because I think with short runway, what happens is you are forced to make choices you don't want to make. That's the, the, that's the problem. Yeah, if you run out of money and investors only want to fund this or they will give you money if you do this, blah, blah, blah. And then you switch your path and then you are not passionate about it anymore, blah, blah. It's, it's like annoying, I think. So better have some buffer. Um, moonlighting, I don't know. Should I recommend moonlighting? I don't know. But I think that was basically the first Traveloka code base was written when, when I was still at LinkedIn, actually. So, I mean, I guess you can do it too in the side, as a side project. <laughs> So uh, I think I'm done. Yeah, that's it. For today. If if I mean if people don't like uh, don't like us out us out because the building is going to be closed, right? I don't know, but okay. okay. Maybe a few questions. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for the sharing. So uh, just now you mentioned that, you know, you started on Traveloka's code base when you're still at LinkedIn. So like, I think a lot of startups, um, they were started first as side projects, but as a founder, how, where, what is that? That point where you say, where you think, this is it, this is what I want to do. I'm sure that this is going to work and I want to commit to it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, it's a bit hard, I think. I think it's, I remember um, there was one day, this is when I was still at LinkedIn and then my co-founder was still at HBS or did he has, I think he basically dropped out around the same time that I quit LinkedIn as well. I think something like that. Yeah, I think there was some whiteboarding session, I remember, where we tally the cost benefit analysis of doing the startup. And that's a weird thing to try to do exercise on, right? Because if you continue working at LinkedIn, this is your salary. It's guaranteed. Maybe it's increased over time. And I got stock option too. Quite a lot of stock option. Okay, so, okay, sure. And if you do the startup, it's very hard. There is a distribution of outcome, right? Could be big, could be medium, could be zero, could be, I don't know, it's hard, hard to tell. But I think it starts to make sense when you, you guys have done enough research about the market or starting to build prototypes or validate competitors ability or whatever it is such that in your head the probability of success start to climb to a point where you think oh it's not bad let's say if it climbs to like 30 percent 40 percent 50 percent i don't i don't know it's, it's all guess right i don't know whether it's 50 percent. i don't know but i feel like oh we have quite a lot of competitive advantage that I think the probability could be pretty high. Okay. At some point, you make the calculation, I don't know, with this kind of thing, whatever, however you do it, and you decide yeah, it's worth it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, yeah. But turns out, but I guess, so that was how I did it last time. <laughs> but after I got older, I guess I started to discover that as you got older, you regret more things that you didn't do than what you did but fail. Even sometimes people can still feel very proud of things they did but fail because they feel it was a very important thing that they tried. But usually people really regret not trying because, oh, I waste my life and so on. So, yeah. I don't know, it's not a very good answer, but okay. Yeah, it's very insightful, thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, hello. Can I ask something? Oh, yes. uh, all right. So I was wondering, because you say that you always like solving big problems, very hard problems. Have you ever considered at any one point of your time in your life that you want to be academia? Ah, good question. Thank you. Yes, multiple times, actually. Yeah. So I think there was, mm, maybe like when I was younger, I just considered it casually because I feel... I just like to explore my own things, basically, right? So at Stanford, maybe my only limitation was the scholarship was only for four years. So I have to squeeze a bunch of stuff. I don't know, it's like a bit hard. So I did not take it seriously at the time. But interestingly, before Assembly started, this is when I was still at Traveloka, maybe around 2016, 17 and whatever, right? I, I start feeling whether I would be happy working on e-commerce for the rest of my life. And I actually started to do research and on my own, read about mostly economics and game theory. So I think it's still one of some of my favorite subjects, I think. But game theory is interesting because it's a branch of mathematics that explain the fundamentals of social systems. Right? So it's basically about actors and games and how they behave and how it produces social outcome. Right? And if you think about it, economics, politics, culture, law, organizations are all social systems with incentives that shape actors' behaviors. So it all is rooted in game theory. So yeah, I was considering applying to grad school, either in computer science, game theory, economics, and all that actually at some point. If I was thinking if I'm ever, if I ever could leave Traveloka, which because it was not clear either, because sometimes it's very hard for founders to suddenly leave, right? So I mean, it's also the, I also didn't know how to do it, basically. So I just figured out a way, but finally it happened. Yeah, I was considering it. Even when Assembly started, I was not sure whether Assembly is going to be a for-profit business, research institute, or just a research project for the rest of its life. I actually didn't know because there are some really difficult problems that seems too difficult. Like, but I think our viewpoint has changed, right? But at the time we thought we have to solve things like detecting the semantic roles of each post in a discussion thread. So we can automatically nudge user behavior to a direct direction. But that turns out to be a problem that's too hard. I think we make a little bit of progress, but it's too hard. So we pivot a bit towards more behavioral mechanism design. So more like a conventional social media platform. But even that, I think the journey was quite tough too. There was quite some difficult problems that we need to solve. But the more time goes by, I started to believe that this company is more a company than a research institute. But well, in the future, we can still have some small teams working on research problems, but most of them are working on the product. That's fine. But the, the answer is yes, I have considered it a lot, actually. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question from Zoom. Um, what is one thing that you would do differently in your career if you know what you know today? Yeah, okay. This is very tricky. I know, right? I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, so thank you for the question. I think this is like a very good question. I always have trouble answering this question, partly because when I was younger, I consider my foolishness or my naivety at that time necessary for me to take a lot of risk. Yeah. So, so the problem with that question is, if I know what I know now, I might not have taken the risk. You know, it's kind of weird, right? So, so, so because my mindset, because I was very green and young and whatever, so I would just do whatever basically at that time. But if there is something I would change though, I would say, I think I was a bit risk averse during my college years, to be honest, for some reason. 
maybe because of being scared in a new environment or something. I'm not sure what it is, but people say in college, some of the greatest value you get is from the network, from people around you who maybe, you know, for now you, you are all friends, let's say, or classmates and so on, right? But I don't know, in 20 years, in 30 years, maybe some of you are CEOs, some of you are founders, some of you are ministers or permsec, some of you are nonprofit leaders, some of you are blah, blah, blah. You know, you don't know. I mean, your life paths could be very diverse going forward, right? So I think somehow I did not, maybe because I was very shy, my English was not very good. I don't know. I think I did not make enough network when I was there did not actively try to participate in early stage startups. So Microsoft and LinkedIn was big companies, right? I wish I actually tried out some earlier stage startups. I remember I was trying to be recruited by like a startup by Joe Lonsdale. I don't know if you know Joe Lonsdale, one of the VCs basically. It's called Adepar or something, but I was getting recruited a couple of times, but I felt, I felt insecure. I just felt, hmm, will I be able to make good income or secure my H1B or whatever. There was just like a lot of discussions. If I could have taken more risk, maybe I would, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. Are there any more questions? Uh, hello, yes. Uh, you mentioned that you were interested in the e-commerce business when in 2015, 2016, right? Oh, sorry. In economics. Oh, economics. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, no. Sorry, okay. sorry. And, and there are many different kinds of economics too, actually. You know, so normally economics is not finance, right? It's different. Okay. Economics is actually very theoretical at the grad school level. But, uh, and there's like macro and micro, right? So the macro one, normally you try to predict broad patterns, like where the market's heading, blah, blah, blah. But they say it's very not that scientific sometimes. It's a lot of opinions, blah, blah, blah. But I would say the more interesting domain is microeconomics, I would say. Because microeconomics is where you ground the big patterns you see in the economy and deriving it from how individual agents behave given the incentives that face them in daily basis. So I think there has been a lot of effort trying to connect that micro to explain macro. And I think it's a very hard problem, but there are probably some interesting schools of thoughts there. And I thought if we can crack this, literally we can change the world in so many different ways. Because if you think about it, social media platforms is a way to shape user behaviors at the micro level to create certain social outcomes. And let's say education or, you know, like sometimes a teacher's contribution is not necessarily like knowledge, like one plus one equals two. It's not, it's not that, but it's the kind of mindset and like the way to see things that permeate you and it shapes how you look at the world. And then it has long-term impact on how you approach your life. Right? So I feel like there are a lot of things that can be explained for from how small little things create systemic impacts. And I really wanted to study that and make a difference. Yeah, sorry. So it's not equal, it's economics actually. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much by the way for the sharing. And it's very, it looks very like that you're very passionate with like what you're doing. So it's like really amazing for us, for me especially. Um, I guess I'm curious on two things. One is first, you mentioned about uh, your interest in game theory and also like uh, uh, making great impacts. Like if you if you need to compare between being a startup founder or let's say a public policy maker like in the government, like which one do you think you would choose? I think as, as someone, I'm, I'm Indonesian as well. So I think that's, and then like uh, the second question would be moving forward, right? There are more and more technocrats who, by technocrats are like uh, startup founders who are currently making a move towards the government. One of which is like the, uh, I think Rahmat from Bukalapak just became a deputy minister, right? I think. So I'm just curious, you know, like, is it something that you, uh, you consider in the future to, you know, like become, uh, I don't know, like maybe in the, inside the government or something. So thank okay. you. Interesting question. Thank you for that. Yeah. I thought it was a very Singaporean question because normally Singaporean people ask whether they should work in the government or outside the government. <laughs> but turns out it's not from Singaporean. Okay, that's interesting question. Yeah, 
Okay. So the way I see that through, and actually the original Gojek founder also became a minister, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so yeah. Uh, the way I think it about it is <laughs> being in government is the macro way of changing the world and being in startup is the micro way of changing the world. Meaning in the government, you leverage existing levers of powers or you become one of them who have levers of powers. Right? Uh, what's the, the pros is you get power right away. Great, okay, you can make changes. But the cons is sometimes it's not that powerful because most governments in the world that is not Singapore government, most of them are very broken actually. But, yeah, but I, think, I think Singapore government is, I think it's like as, as good as you get. I don't know, like, I mean, if you have lived abroad before, you will witness how broken, like a lot of public infrastructure and blah, 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 everything else outside Singapore, to be honest. Yeah, so I think you should be grateful. Uh, but um, yeah, so maybe, so I guess maybe being a government official in Singapore is a great thing, but I'm not sure about outside of Singapore. <laughs> I think I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, because because uh, I think the dysfunction is because the institution. Let's say the institutions are a bit not that clean, a bit corrupt, a bit dysfunctional. There's nepotism. There's whatever, right? There's a lot of issues, right? So even if you have a lot of power from the top, you try to project the power, but then ultimately it's not you who deliver the benefits, right? It's actually people. All these officials below you who deliver the benefits and in a broken system all these officials don't have the right motivations they they don't do a good job they don't produce quality job you know so then you still cannot create impact i think it's you can but it's just hard that's why to me the startup way is like a game theory way of doing it basically basically instead of top down change can we identify a small micro behaviors that we can help nudge in the life of a user and scale it to 100 million users if possible and ideally align it with something good. So if each user becomes a bit better in their behaviors or in their quality of life, if you scale it to 100 million users, suddenly you create a lot of change too, but bottom up. That's why I kind of like the startup model technically because it's a bit cross geography and you can control the ingredients to create that impact, I think. Yeah, thanks. Except if you are in Singapore, then that's a different story. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think on the topic of game theory, someone on Zoom also asked if you have any readings wow, that you wanna recommend. Oh no, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh no, okay, uh, okay. Wow, so many people are interested in game theory. Okay, <laughs> but I think, okay. So a lot of readings are too technical. So I think a lot of them are not enjoyable, <laughs> I would say. But I think one of the funniest, and more is the interesting book in game theory is probably it's by Kaushik Basu. It's basically an ex ex chief of World Bank. So I don't know. It's it's like an Indian name, like Kaushik Basu. He uh, somehow his tone of writing is very funny. I don't know why. Basically, so other game theorists start with. Define, define an agent. Okay, and then define agent behavior. So like, okay, it's so boring. Nobody, nobody cares. <laughs> but, but this guy, maybe because of his experience in developing countries and World Bank, he start with a problem statement. Let's say, hmm, let's say he was in India and uh, he was from India, right? And then he noticed, why is there a culture of bright killing? If you ever heard of it, right? For example, like, so if you are a wife, your husband dies, and then you have to be killed too or something like that. I don't, I don't understand actually. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe it's not practice anymore, but turns out it's still quite rampant in rural areas. And the interesting thing is, if you ask every single person individually, one-on-one, -on -one, hey, do you still believe in this culture? They say, oh, absolutely. No, 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 no. This, this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And you ask another person, do you still believe in this culture? Oh, no, 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 no. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but all of them, each of them is too afraid to violate the norm. Why is that? But if you ask every single person, nobody actually believes in the norm anymore. Okay. So what explains that? And turns out after that, he breaks down the mathematical model. Turns out it's be their behaviors is not of because what they believe, but it's because of what they believe other people believe. Yeah. And that's a recursive structure. And turns out one of the core issues there is because it's not allowed. So this is the interesting thing. If 
bride killing was allowed, it can be overturned actually easily because people don't no longer believe. But because it was a norm, a norm is allowed without a central note to be able to make a change. A norm is very difficult to change, actually. So he described it mathematically, then he proves that a norm, basically he proves two things. A norm is a law, basically, and a norm exhibits certain behaviors that a law does not, and this is explains why this culture persists. That's how we explain things. But he is not, so, it's not always that serious. Sometimes he uh, talk about funny stuff, like the experience riding a bus from different province in India, blah, blah, blah. So he tries to portray things in a very funny way. So, yeah. I recommend his book. Uh, okay, so like, um, uh, I have like two questions. The first one, I think you'll talk a little bit about like, uh, while talking about your second project, the, the current ongoing project is that, what's your take on like venture backbone? Uh, startups and like these bootstrappable like businesses because like um I heard like I think like maybe like current your stuff is startup is like mostly like bootstrap and the second thing is that like I don't know if there is a answer to this but I'm curious like what do you think uh, is like the methodology to find those, those like zero to one businesses because like, I think like these ideas are kind of like hard to find maybe like like maybe like uh, a long time ago people have been saying like startup is all over and like Stuff. So it's very difficult to find these ideas, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on how to find those ideas. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's like quite a lot of questions. Okay, but thank you. Though uh, maybe I'll try to, for the interest of time, let me answer a bit quickly. Maybe right. So two questions. Be what do you think about venture back versus non venture back startups? The second one is, sure, source of zero to one ideas. Okay. Sure. Okay. Let's start with venture back startups. Right. To be honest. Venture capital is a new thing, right? So if you look at the history of Silicon Valley in 1960s, 1970s, most people did not know what a VC was actually. So a lot of companies do bank loans oftentimes, and maybe there are some angels. So, and it's like rare, right? You have to find the right person, but VC was not a thing, right? It's new. So, um, but it become popular because it's easier than bank loans, I guess. But if you think about it, it's just simply different ways to get funding. Right? Bank loan is also funding, but bank loan takes your future revenue and make that to fund your business today. But the venture capital is very different. It takes part of your ownership in the business and give your the fund today. Right? So isn't it bad then? I mean, why do you want to give your company to somebody else, right? Turns out it makes sense if your company is high risk. Because if it's high risk, you are not sure about getting loan from a bank because you are not sure if you can make the revenue. But if your business is not high risk, for example, some tech businesses are not high risk, right? You know, take Snowflake. Snowflake is not high risk at all. I mean, you already have a product sell more and you will get revenue for sure you'll get revenue so if you are snowflake why do i have to raise fund anymore doesn't make sense i just borrow because i keep more of my company that way yeah so i and this is the truth for small business as well so if you are doing a mom and pop shops trading e-commerce or fashion or whatever you get revenue from day one right so why do i give my company to an investor that doesn't make sense i get revenue from day one yeah, so it's just a different strategy of what you want to sacrifice to get funding today and that depends on the risk and so on so yeah um yeah and maybe like the second question zero to one ideas hmm, good point this hard but i think uh just actually i don't know if I, I could have a good answer because also, people who have zero to one ideas are very rare as well. But I think if you look at the, some commonalities, okay, I don't know if I can give a good answer to this, but because I don't read, I haven't read, I, I, I read some biographies of some of these people, but I haven't read enough to do some pattern recognition from their lives, I think. But normally, some of these people are super obsessed about something. I don't know. I'm not sure why is it, but sometimes they have broken family. Sometimes they have like bad personal experience. Sometimes they are. Or sometimes it could also be, um, let's say, they just want to prove themselves or something. They're like something that is outlier about them. I'm not sure what. It's all different in different people. But they really, usually, they really don't even want to listen to people around them. People, they just like have ideas that brew in their head and they believe it has to be that way. Some of them fail, but some of the successful ones are super, super successful. So I don't know. It's like, 
So sometimes people call it edge, edge, sometimes. meaning you are not. Uh, actually, Sequoia Capital has this thing too. They specifically, tell, I mean, if you look at the websites, right? They are looking for, they are looking for imbalanced people. Actually, <laughs> yeah, they actually say that the way that if an, if they interview somebody and the person is too polished, normal, well-rounded, they probably can be successful, but will be medium level successful. Usually, the a bit edgy, crazy one usually make it. Big. I don't know why. But <laughs> Sorry, it's not a good answer. Right? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Darianto, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to know who are your, some of your like personal idols? Uh, okay, Th okay, thank you. Sometimes I got asked this question. So I think it's weird, I think. So I never feel that I relate to any of the so-called role models, to be honest, partly because, hmm, actually, I don't know why. So for example, right, so if people ask who, in, who has influenced me the most, I would say it's the great ideas and worldviews of mostly dead people. So meaning great thinkers, great academia, great leaders that have died probably anywhere from, from like some AI professor like Marvin Minsky to Nelson Mandela, maybe to, you can think of Jesus as a historical character too, maybe, you know, like, yeah, or maybe you can think of, yeah, or some academia, like some, game theorists, let's say, right? So I mean, there's a lot of lessons and there's a lot of baked in wisdom in a lot of these characters, I would say. I mean, even, yeah, but, but I usually don't think about the person. So I think I don't usually idolize a person because most people are flawed normally. And even I'm flawed too, right? So I mean, we can do, make good choices, bad choices. Sometimes we are right, sometimes we are wrong. That's okay. But I draw inspiration from what are some of the most courageous, like visionary things people do, even if other part of their lives are messed up. You know, yeah. But there are some very admirable thing they, they decide to do. And what can we learn from that? So I draw a lot of bits from things like that. Yeah. Um, are there any more questions? Um. If not, uh, let's thank Duranto for the amazing talk. Thank you. Yeah. thank you all. Thanks for having been a great audience. Like I think the questions are great too. Thanks. Amazing talk. Yeah. yeah, just some slides to like uh, end things off. Um, yeah, just like to have a shout out to our sponsors, Jet Bridge for the food, uh, the Hangar Enterprise for the venue as well. Yeah, and another thing, uh, we are still recruiting. So if you would like to spread the hacker culture, Organize all events, please uh, join. And yeah, uh, these are our channels. And yeah, that's about it. So thank you for coming down. Uh, see you guys next week. <laughs>